Hi, welcome to another Biomedical Engineers TV video. In this video, we will look into heart-lung machines. In this video, we will cover beginning of the heart-lung machine, what is the heart-lung machine, what are the components of heart-lung machines, and what is ECMO, or ECMO. Let's start the video with the beginning of the heart-lung machine. Like many medical advances, the development of the heart-lung machine depended heavily on animal research. In 1931, John Gibbon had been moved by the death of a patient during cardiac surgery. Convinced the patient would have survived if their blood circulation had been artificially maintained, he began to investigate the possibility of building an external device that could do the job of the heart and lungs for short intervals. Gibbon and his wife carried out their initial research using cats, and by 1935 they had developed a machine that could replace the function of a cat's heart and lungs for 20 minutes. These early animal experiments allowed Gibbon to test different types of pumps and oxygenators to improve performance. However, the machine damaged blood cells and most cats lived no longer than 23 days after surgery. From 1945, Gibbon and other researchers began to refine the methods using experiments in dogs. Although initial survival rates were low, these experiments revealed the need to add filters to the heart-lung device to prevent blood clots and to apply suction to the heart to prevent air from entering it during surgery. Once these issues were addressed, most dogs survived their open-heart surgery and the heart-lung machine was ready for use in humans. What is a heart-lung machine? A heart-lung machine, also called a cardiopulmonary bypass machine, is a device that takes over the function of the body's heart and lungs during open-heart or traditional surgery. The machine circulates the essential, oxygen-rich blood to the brain and other vital organs during open-heart surgery, allowing the cardiac surgery team to operate on a heart that is blood-free and still. When the surgery is complete, the heart is restarted and the heart-lung machine is disconnected. The heart-lung machine intercepts the blood at the right atrium, the upper heart chamber, before it passes into the heart. Using a pump, the machine delivers the blood to a reservoir, which adds oxygen to the blood. The pump then sends the oxygen-rich blood to the aorta and through the rest of the body. The machine, which is operated by a trained and certified specialist called a perfusion technologist, also removes carbon dioxide and other waste products from the blood and delivers anesthesia and medications into the recirculated blood. Also, in some cases, it cools the blood. Cool blood lowers the body's temperature, which helps to further protect the brain and other vital organs during surgery. Let's know about components of heart-lung machines. The heart-lung machine is a device that is connected to the blood vessels and serves as the person's heart and lungs for a period of time. In other words, the patient's blood bypasses the heart to enter the machine instead, where it is oxygenated just as it would be in the lungs. From there, the machine pumps the blood out into the rest of the body. In doing so, the heart-lung machine essentially replaces the most vital organs, thereby sustaining the patient's life. From its original development to the components of current models to its future applications, the heart-lung machine is truly an impressive feat of technology that integrates the engineering principles of fluid flow, pressure gradients, and heat transfer into one life-saving device. Upon leaving the venous reservoir, blood next travels into the heart-lung machine's pump, which utilizes compression force or centrifugal force to drive blood flow. A pump may come in either one of two types, roller pumps or centrifugal pumps. In a roller pump, the blood enters a curved track of tubing made of a flexible material, often PVC, latex, or silicone. As the blood enters, two cylindrical rollers rotate and slide forward, constricting the tubing. This compression reduces the volume of the tube, giving the blood no room to go but forward. Just as squeezing a tube of toothpaste pushes the paste forward and out of the tube, compressing the roller pump forces the blood to flow forward through the rest of the bypass machine. While roller pumps may be used as the primary pump in a heart-lung machine, centrifugal pumps are often used as an alternative. The centrifugal pump is comprised of a plastic wheel that rotates rapidly, propelling the liquid away from the center of rotation. 
Imagine spinning a bucket of water overhead fast enough so that water is pressed outward against the bucket and does not fall out. The same force is utilized in the heart-lung machine as the rotation of the centrifugal pump forces the blood to flow past the spinning wheel and out toward the next section of tubing. While some heart-lung machine manufacturers prefer this type of pump because they believe it reduces the formation of harmful clotting elements in the blood, at this point in time, both types of pumps are widely used. Blood flows from the pump into the heat exchanger, which uses the concept of heat transfer to cool the blood down to the optimal temperature for surgery. The human body normally maintains an internal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, but during cardiac surgery, physicians lower the patient's core temperature to a state of moderate hypothermia, or 5 to 10 degrees lower than usual. Oxygen gas is more soluble in cold blood than in warm blood. Thus, lowering the temperature maximizes the amount of oxygen the patient's blood cells can carry. Following the basic principle of heat transfer, a warmer object will always transfer heat to any colder object with which it is in contact. Similarly, if a cold object touches a warmer object, the warmer object will be cooled. That is precisely what occurs in the heart-lung machine's heat exchanger. It consists of a thermally adjustable compartment of cold water with plastic tubes submerged in it. As blood flows through the tubes, thermal energy is transferred between the water and the tubing, and then between the tubing and the blood. The warmer object, the blood, becomes colder, while the cooler object, the water, becomes warmer. Thus, the heat exchanger cools the blood to the desired temperature. From the heat exchanger, the cooled blood enters the oxygenator, where it is imbued with oxygen. Today's heart-lung machines use an oxygenator that attempts to mimic the lung itself. This oxygenator, aptly called a membrane oxygenator, consists of a thin membrane designed like the thin membranes of the alveoli, the air-filled sacs that comprise the lungs. Venous blood from the heat exchanger flows past one side of the membrane while oxygen gas is stored on the other. Microspores in the membrane allow oxygen gas to flow into the blood and into the blood cells themselves. Just as blood spontaneously flows along a pressure gradient, gases also move from regions of high pressure to regions of low partial pressure. The oxygenator is designed such that the oxygen pressure on the gas side of the membrane is much higher than the pressure in the blood. Thus, oxygen passes through the membrane into the blood following the natural high to low pressure gradient. At this point in the journey through the heart-lung machine, the blood has been collected, cooled, and oxygenated, so it is nearly ready to return to the patient's body. Before this can happen, however, it must pass through a filter to eliminate the potential for embolisms. Anything that could lead to a blockage of a blood vessel, whether it is an air bubble, a piece of synthetic material, or a clotting protein, poses a great risk to the patient and must be filtered out of the returning blood. The filters used in the heart-lung machine are comprised of nylon or polyester thread woven into a screen with small pores. The small pores trap the harmful bubbles or particles, allowing purer blood, free from dangerous embolism-causing particles, to flow through. After being filtered, the blood travels through plastic tubes called arterial cannulas. Arteries, the blood vessels that deliver oxygen-rich blood from the heart to the rest of the body, have the highest speed of any vessel. In order to imitate this, engineers designed the arterial cannulas to be very narrow. In fluid dynamics, the flow rate of a liquid through a vessel is equal to the cross-sectional area times the speed of flow. Thus, tubes like the arterial cannulas that have a smaller diameter allow for a higher blood velocity. During surgery, the physician inserts the cannulas into one of the major arteries of the patient, such as the aorta or the femoral artery. Blood then leaves the last component of the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, enters the patient's own vessels, and makes its natural journey through the circulatory system. Let's know about ECMO machines. ECMO stands for Extracorporeal Membrane Oxygenation. The ECMO machine is similar to the heart-lung bypass machine used in open-heart surgery. It pumps and oxygenates a patient's blood outside the body, allowing the heart and lungs to rest. When you are connected to an ECMO, blood flows through tubing to an artificial lung in the machine that adds oxygen and takes out carbon dioxide. Then the blood is warmed to body temperature and pumped back into your body. There are two types of ECMO. The VA ECMO is connected to both a vein and an artery, and it is used when there are problems with both the heart and lungs. 
The VV ECMO is connected to one or more veins, usually near the heart, and is used when the problem is only in the lungs. USCF is now using a smaller portable ECMO device that is light enough to be carried by one person and can be transported in an ambulance or helicopter, making it possible to provide ECMO relief in emergency cases. We hope you like this information on heart-lung machines. If you did like it, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and see you guys in the next video.